All right, guys. So we're looking now at our first um, big point of analysis. This is the elements of plot. Okay. And this is important because every story has a plot. Right. Every story has a plot, including, and here's a parallel for you, including your life. Okay. Your life can be plotted on a graph just like this. And it's the same idea with the story, a beginning, a middle, and an end, in a nutshell, okay? You look at the definition that I have up there under the elements of plot. It says a causal, that's causal, not casual. Sometimes I make that mistake too. It's a causal series of events, okay? If you remember back to the day in comp one, or maybe even before that, when you had cause and effect, okay? And you learn about cause and effect and how every effect has a cause and every cause generally leads to an effect. In other words, if I slap my hands together, the effect is a clap top, right? So cause and effect. So this is, is kind of linking itself back to the definition there with the word causal. Causal means things are being caused, okay? Causal series of events. That means events that are caused by themselves, by each other, okay? So we have the first real element of plot, okay? And then that, when that happens, it causes the second one. And when that happens, it causes the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one, okay? They cause each other. So if you're watching a movie, and you recognize one of these elements, you kind of get an idea of what's going to happen next because you're aware, because of this, that the story is a causal series of events. So that means if you recognize something going on in the rising action, you can pretty much guarantee that you're about to see the climax of the story or the high point of the story. Okay? If you recognize, let's say, elements of conflict happening in the rising action, all right, you know where you came from, you know that you already had the exposition, okay, and you're about to head into the climax. And by the same token, if the story is at its climax, its high point, you know that you're about to ratchet things down with the falling action, and then the resolution, also known as the data law, okay. So, you can kind of get an idea of what's going on and the things that we're going to talk about with plot and also conflict uh, can be spoilers, guys. If you're sitting in a movie and you recognize some of these things, okay, it can be a spoiler. It can tell you what's coming pretty clearly. Okay, just don't tell the person you're with because then they get mad at you. I did that to somebody one time because the movie was sad. And my child one with Bruce Willis and the kid. What was that? Ghost uh Sixth Sense. Sixth Sense, right. Yeah, I mean I figured it out pretty quickly that the kid was already dead, or that he was dead. And I turned to my friend and I, I said, Yeah, he's a ghost. And then of course when it was shown throughout the movie that he was, he kept talking to me like pretending to remember that because I'm really so it's not the kind of thing you can forget once somebody tells you. So just be cautious with what you learn because it can act as a spoiler. Okay. So let's look at this. You can see we have a little bell curve going on here. Okay. Meaning it generally starts bottom and rises up and then goes down again. Okay. And every story that we tell, guys, and every story that you've ever heard or seen or whatever, whether it's a movie or a novel or a short story, they all fit some form of this bell curve. Okay? They all have, in essence, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now, some are skewed, okay? some for effect are out of order. For example, the movie Pulp Fiction, any Pulp Fiction fans here? Quentin Tarantino? That movie, if you didn't know, there was a that movie is told backwards, okay? So next time you watch Pulp Fiction, pay attention to that. It starts at the end and it works its way to, to the beginning, okay? 
okay. Most of them. There's little things in there that give you clues as to what's going on. So, but it does run this way, okay? It may start off at the end and run this way to the beginning, or it may start at the beginning and run to the end in the standard form, okay? But generally speaking, every story has that curve. And if you, if you take that curve, guys, and you go like this with it, all right? And I said the analogy is life, all right? You can plot a life with it, all right? Birth, then everything that happens in the middle, and then death, okay? And the same with an element of plot. When you're looking at the elements of plot for a story, and it's good that we're doing short stories because generally there's only one plot line running, okay? Because it's short, and we often don't have time. But most stories have many plot lines going on, guys. Think of a plot line. If you look at a plot line, think of it as a snapshot. Okay. So when we look at it this way for life, that's a snapshot of a specific person's life. All right. Now, we can zoom in at any point. We can zoom in at any point. Okay. So here you have the big plot line, somebody's life. And then we can zoom in at any point and find lots of these little plot lines throughout, right? And give an event that's happened to you in the course of your life, okay? Tell me the story of something exciting that happened to you when you were 17. And you could, you could tell me a story, right? I remember one time, blah, 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 you tell me a story. Okay? What am I doing? Now I'm zooming in on that one aspect right here, okay? call it 17. So we're taking a snapshot of one story from when you were 17 and looking at it, but it fits in the whole, okay? In this part, let's say, of your plot line, okay? And then, of course, the end of your plot line would be death, right? And the events leading to it, okay? And it's a causal series of events, right? So in other words, if this is when you were 17, then you know this is when you were 18. 1920, blah, 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 one more. Doesn't go backwards. When you're talking about life, it's sequential. It's a causal series of events. I turned 18 because I was 17. And I was 17 because I was already 16. Or else I couldn't have been 17. You can't skip, right? Linear, from our perspective. I don't know what it is from the universe's perspective, but from our perspective, it's linear. It's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. And stories are the same way, usually. I showed you a couple of examples that weren't a few seconds ago, but for the most part, stories follow this. Okay. So let's look at it. Remember, snapshot, right? So let's look at this in terms of uh, W.W. Jacob's Monkey's Paw. The Monkey's Paw, that's a great story. You can read The Monkey's Paw. If you like horror and suspense, that's a good one. Okay. I think it's one of our stories. So The Monkey's Paw, you have a family, Mr. and Mrs. White, and you have their son. Okay. And in a nutshell, what happens is they get a visitor. The father gets a visitor from a farm, a foreign land, and he breaks this thing they call the monkey's paw. And what it is, it's a talisman. Just like a good luck thing, like a rabbit's foot. Only it grants wishes. Three wishes. Okay. And so the story of the monkey's paw is the white family dealing with this talisman you know, from the beginning to the end. The beginning is when they're sitting around at the parlor and the guy visits and he brings the monkey's paw. And then the wishes happen. And then so I'm not going to tell you what happens in case you want to read it. I don't want to read it because it's a very good suspense story. Okay. But this is a perfect layout. Okay. So when we're looking at the snapshot, the plot line of the monkey's paw, okay, it deals with a specific event in the white family's lives. 
which is the monkey's paw. But they existed in fiction, right? They existed before that happened. In other words, before they got the monkey's paw. And they also existed after they got the monkey's paw. Okay. So lots of other things probably happened to this family as well, but we only heard about this one little snapshot thing because it was an interesting story. Okay. And so we have the plot that takes place from the snapshot of them getting the monkey's paw, making the wishes, and seeing what happens as a result. Okay. But they existed before that, just like in the life plot line, you existed before you were 17. If I'm only looking at this and seeing that this is what happened when you were 17, I'm not going to assume that you blinked into existence here and then you waked out here, right? No, you were born 17 years ago and you lived however many years afterwards. So it's just a snapshot, guys. That's what the plot is. It's just a snapshot of the events, okay? So the first event we have here the exposition, all right? And you can see there's a dotted line here, and before that we have this thing called the inciting climactic event, okay? Inciting meaning starting, climactic event meaning piece of the climax. So it's a starting piece of the climax, otherwise known as a hook, okay? You know, for example, you go, and you open up a book, let's say it's the old days, you actually open up a book. You open up a book and you start reading, right? And generally speaking, in, in modern literature, it starts off with something exciting, right? So if it's a book about a serial killer, let's say a book about Jack the Ripper, okay? It's probably gonna start out with one of his murders, okay? If it's a book about um, a giant shark that's attacking bathers off the coast of a beach in, in New England, Jaws, okay? Um, it starts off with that girl and the guy getting drunk at the bonfire, and then she goes into the ocean and swims, and she gets attacked by the shark. That's where it starts, okay? It's a hook. It's designed to hook you and draw you into the story, okay? I use the word modern lit here, guys, because in classic literature, um, you didn't always have a book. You didn't need a book. Classic literature, people read. That's what they did. There was no TV. There was no radio. There was nothing else to do. You read. That's why the Bible became such a popular book, because everybody had it, and everybody read it. Okay? If you had a book, you read it, and then you passed it around, and everybody read it because it wasn't like it is today, guys. There weren't many things vying for your attention back then. Classic literature, okay? So you didn't really need a book. Today, right, kind of need a book, right? My, my books are on my phone, God help me, okay? I have a Kindle for iOS on my phone, and I can literally read there. I love it because I can make it bigger and I can see it, okay? Whereas with the old books, might not necessarily be able to see at this point, right? Um, so, I love books. I have a huge library in my home office. I rarely read from it anymore because I can't see it. My eyes are going that way. But Kindle has opened up a thing where I can literally make the talk bigger, so it's kind of nice. Um, but think about that. So I open it up, and then as I'm reading, starting to read, my phone buzzes, Flip it over to Outlook. Oh, it's a student. They have a question up on the phone. I wonder what the weather's going to be tomorrow. Let me check the weather. <laughs> yeah, I put this post on Twitter a little while ago. Let me see how it's done in the comments. I look at Twitter. And by this time, it's dinner time, and I'm, I can't read anymore because I'm out of time. What happened? I, I got distracted. That team was on the Phillies. So I'm going to flip that on and watch that. There goes my reading time. I got a lot of distractions lying for my time. So a hook is important. If I'm reading a story and it grabs my collar and shakes me and says, look at this, and it's interesting, it hooks me in, then I tend to ignore the distractions and I go right into the story. And that's the point. 
I, when I wrote my novels in the beginning, the first one, I didn't have a hook. Everything was sequential. And I got the note back saying, need a hook. Okay. So I went right into the main part of the story and literally took a piece of the climax, copied it, pasted it to the front, and then it was accepted. Okay. Modern lit needs the hook. Okay. So this is the hook, guys. This is what you need to grab somebody's attention and hold them so that they continue to read. Okay. Again, short stories that we're doing, most of them probably do not have books because they're too short. They're short enough to where you can read through it probably before you get distracted by something else because it's short. That's the whole point. But a novel, on the other hand, is a little bit different from a story. You kind of need a hook. All right? So you have the hook, and then once that happens, it slows down, and you go into this part, the exposition. Okay. And the exposition kind of tells you what it does. It exposes it. Okay? Lost the word exposition. It exposes the character, the setting, you know, the, the time, the place, those kind of things that are important in most cases to the rest of it. Because you need to know who's in the story. You need to know where the story's at in most cases, not all. But sometimes the setting is very important, right? You can't have a story about igloos that's set in Rio. Why? Because it's too hot. It's tropical. There's no igloos in Rio. No natural ones. Okay? And by the same token, you're not going to have a carnival festival in Juneau, Alaska. Why? Because it doesn't happen in Juneau, Alaska. It happens in Rio de Janeiro. Okay? So sometimes the setting is important. Other times, yeah. Not so much. The monkey's paw. It's not hypercritical where it's happening. It's mostly happening in the White's house, right? There are a couple of incidents that happen away, like at the guy's work. But for the most part, it's in their house. So it really doesn't matter whether that house is in Milwaukee, London, Sydney. It doesn't matter. Okay. It's not going to affect the outcome of the story. So if you decide to use, for example, the exposition, make sure that it's important enough, right, to draw attention to, right? So is there something in the exposition that's unique to that story? That's the question you have to ask. Right? So we meet the people. We see where we're, we see where it's happening. Also when it's happening, all right? Okay, you can see the definitions. The inciting climactic event is the hook, a piece of the climax brought to the front of the story to draw the reader in, usually in modern literature. And then the exposition, the setting is revealed. Characters are introduced, inciting incidents started, conflict set into motion. Okay? Conflicts. When we think of the word conflict, guys, we automatically get a negative connotation, right? the Vietnam conflict, right? It's an armed, usually like a war kind of thing, a fight, if you will, right? A conflict, and it means that. But in literature, it also means an interaction, okay? An interaction. So if we were to pass in the hallway and I say, hey, how you doing? interaction, right? Simple one. You pass in the hallway and say hi. And then you go on your way. Okay. It's a conflict. Man versus man. Same time. Right? Person to person. Character to character. Okay? It's one of our types of conflict. This one, man versus man. Okay. But what is it? It's an interaction. A significant interaction. One that moves the plot forward. So does me saying hello to her in the hallway and her saying hi back and then us continuing on our way, does that move the plot forward at all? Does that change anything? Probably not. It wasn't really significant. Now, if we stopped and chatted, and because we stopped and chatted, she was late for her class, and the teacher didn't care why, and she got in trouble, 
now it becomes significant because it affected something. Okay? So a, a normal everyday interaction, you're driving down your driveway to go to school and the mailman is delivering mail and you nod and say, hey, and they say, hey, and then you keep going. Yes, it was, a, it was an interaction, but it wasn't significant. Nothing happened as a result of it. But again, let's say you stopped and chatted, and because you stopped and chatted, and here's the cause and effect stuff, guys, that will blow your mind if you think about it. Because you stopped and chatted, you, you missed the light that you would normally made. And because you missed that light, somebody was whipping through the intersection the other way that you would have otherwise missed, but when the light turned green, you went, and you were in the intersection just at the right time to get T-boned by that car. And you got into an accident. You weren't hurt, but your car was smashed. Okay. That happened because you took an extra two minutes you know, to talk to the mailman. Now it's significant because something happened because of that. Right. And you don't always see it right away, guys. So you could be late, right? Because you stopped and chatted with the mailman, so you were late. So when you got to class, you were 10 minutes late and you missed the teacher announcing there was a a conference going on next week that you needed to go to having to do with job placement okay but because you missed that announcement you didn't get that and so you missed the conference and because you missed the conference you didn't get to put your name in for a job that you would have gotten had you been there right and you would have made x amount of money and you would have had a family and a nice house and blah 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 but because you missed that conference you didn't get that job you got a lesser paying job and you weren't able to get that particular house in that particular part of the town. And you didn't have a family because you couldn't afford it, and blah, blah, blah. So you see how it can affect you. If you don't see that right away, right? It's like when you're 17, right? Realizing that something that's gonna happen when you're 42 is gonna have a big effect on you. We don't see it because we're in the, we're in the line of time, right? I said it was linear, that means it's timeline, right? Start, middle, end. And when you're in the middle of it, you can't see the end because you're too far embedded. You can't see the forest through the trees, that's what it means. Okay. When you're in the midst of it, you don't really see it. But if you look back on it, so now when I look back on things, if I can remember, I can see how everything connected in my life up to this point. But while I was going through it, I certainly couldn't. Nobody can. You know, unless you're some kind of spirit and can move back and forth on the timeline, you really can't see you know, anything beyond what's happening right now. All right? So conflict is a significant interaction that moves the plot forward. And this starts right after the exposition. We get into the rising action. The action rises. What do we mean? Conflicts start to happen. The, the fuel that fuels a story starts to happen. And we have four types. Okay. Man meaning mankind. Man versus self. That's anything that happens in a character's head. Okay. So remember me asking last week how many in the year have an inner monologue? That's part of that, man versus self. So anytime a character feels doubt, or anger, or jealousy, or happiness, or or whatever, man versus self. Okay. So your character gets up in the morning and is hesitant about what to wear because they have a very important interview that day. And so they're going through their clothes and they're, no, I don't want that one. That makes me look fat. That makes me look thin. That makes me look too short. But you know how it goes. That's man versus self. Is it significant? Not unless it makes you late for something or early or whatever. Remember the definition. One that moves the plot forward. So the normal course of events, the character thinking about stuff doesn't necessarily affect anything. It can, but it's not a guarantee. Okay. Any interaction a character has within his or her own head, doubt, happiness, anything in the head. Okay. Think of this in terms of the parallel about his life, right? When I say character, think person, think yourself. Okay. It's an easy way to look at it. So when you think about something, that's, in, that's a man versus self conflict. 
is it significant? Second one is arguably the most common, that's man versus man, an interaction a character has with another character. Right? We have lots of those all day, in most cases, especially if you're in school or at work or whatever, you interact. And that's what a conflict is all about, interaction. Okay? So notice in parentheses, the first one says internal. And it says internal because remember the definition, inside their own head. Okay? Second one is external, meaning it's not in the head anymore, it's with another person. Okay. Notice the word character, guys. In most cases, the things that we read it are gonna be people. Okay? Doesn't have to be though, right? How many characters does a movie like Finding Nemo have? Nemo is a character. His father is a character. Dory is a character. They're not people. Okay. So it's the principles of a story that make a character, not necessarily a person. So when I say man versus man, I'm talking about characters. Okay. So that's an interaction a character has with another character. So for example, two characters having a discussion, two characters arguing, two characters coming up with an idea or a plan, two characters getting into an argument about that plan. Okay. That's what makes it a conflict, and the fact that it moves the plot forward. Okay. Man versus society, that's the second external one. That is any interaction a character has with, for example, a law or a rule, or a, a social norm, okay? Um, society, for example, in here, okay? We have unspoken rules that when somebody's speaking, you don't speak over them, you, you know, wait for a second, and you, when they stop, you talk, or you raise your hand, whatever, however you want to get attention, okay? It's sort of an unwritten rule, but it's man versus society. Okay? We have our own rules in here, for example, speaking. When you came to school today, if you stopped at a traffic light, and versus society, why? Because a traffic light is a, an emblem of a law, which means you stop at the intersection, okay? Is it significant? Not normally. If you stop at that light and something happens because you stopped at that light, then it becomes significant. And remember he saying 15 minutes ago, that's going to vary from story to story. Okay, so not everything is going to stand out in every story. So what might be a good point of analysis for her story might not be for your story. Okay, it might be something completely different. You're going to have to read the story and see what sticks out to you. Okay. All of those stories, you're going to find models for each one of these things. Okay. So you just have to, you know, you just have to find it, that's all. Right. The final external one, man versus nature, supernature. Okay, let me back up a second. I have the word taboo in that number three, man versus society, what's a taboo? We all know the word, right? And we all may, maybe even use the word taboo. What, what is a taboo? Uh, something. Okay, what's the difference between a taboo and a law? That's a good question. You're correct in what you said, but it's more. That's part of it, something you shouldn't do, right? Generally speaking, a taboo is like an unwritten law, if you will. It's like a, it's like a societal law. For example, um, incest. Incest is actually legal up to, I believe, the second cousin. Well, beyond the second cousin, like the first cousin, or obviously the niece, nephew, sister, brother, whatever. That, that's when it's illegal. But it's a taboo, okay? Cannibalism. It's a taboo. It also happens to be against the law. It wasn't against the law years ago. Murder was against the law, so if you killed somebody and ate them, you got charged with killing, but not necessarily eating. Yeah. But it's an unwritten law. Okay. A 
but it was generally something that's hardwired in our heads and makes us kind of go, ew. Right? It makes us feel icky. Okay? And the reason for that is hardwired, guys. It's survival of the species stuff, right? If cannibalism weren't taboo, guys, and we ate humans, how long would it be before we were extinct? Same thing with incest. When you breed too close together, the gene pool gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and you start having issues, right? They find all these issues when they dig up these mummies in Egypt, right? Because you had the sister marrying the brother and having kids just to keep it in the royal line. And what happens is the kid's born with all kinds of birth defects because the gene pool was too close. So it's kind of a taboo, right? Killing is a taboo. Killing other humans is a taboo, believe it or not. It's hard to kill people, guys. I know you do it in Call of Duty. Okay, I get it. Me too. And it's fun. But in real life, it's hard to kill someone. It is hard to pull that trigger and end somebody's life. Okay. Um, well, it's one of the things basic training is all about in the military. The deconditioning you against stuff like that so that you can kill when you have to. Okay. But the normal person tends to be taboo. Why? Because, think of the logic. If we start killing people and it's easy and fun, pretty soon there won't be anybody left to kill. Again, it's survival of the species. And the animal world is the same way, guys. They have the same, mostly the same taboos, right? Most animals aren't cannibal for that reason. Most animals know not, not to breed with their, their parents, for example. It's just an instinct. It's a hard wire. Right? And that's, that's what that is. So there are some elements, perhaps, of taboo in some of those stories that you could probably hit pretty, pretty well. All right? So let's keep going. Man versus nature, supernature. Okay? This is anything that has to do with an interaction with the natural or supernatural world. Okay. Rain, freezing cold, extreme heat, anything that affects the story, right? So you have a story set in the desert and it's hot, and because it's hot, they can't do this certain activity until it's dark. And because of that, something happens and blah, blah, blah. Okay. That's an example of man versus nature. If your character is driving, they get to school and they can't get a good spot and it's cold out, but they have to walk and it's raining, they're going to get wet and they're going to sit in class wet. And maybe they're going to get sick because of that. And maybe because they got sick, they're going to miss that conference we talked about next week. And because they missed that conference, they're not going to get the job they wanted and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that's an example of how man versus nature was a steering factor in the events that happened. Okay. Because it was raining and because you got wet, you got sick, and on and on it goes. Okay. Also supernatural if you're a fan. Harry Potter, 90% of that is that. Supernatural. Why? Because there's no, no magic in the real world. Okay. Unfortunately. Great if there was. They're terrible. Kids are terrible. Yeah. Doesn't exist. But in that world, it does, okay? If you're a, a Twilight fan, vampires and werewolves, okay? Supernatural, okay? So anything with that could be your central point of analysis, okay? UFOs, aliens, right now, they're in the realm of supernature because nobody's ever seen one. When we do see one, then it becomes part of the natural world. And that's the interesting thing. That's why I use the word supernature instead of supernatural, because most things we label as supernatural, guys, are things that we simply don't understand yet. Okay? We used to think that lightning was some old guy in a cloud who got pissed off at people and flung lightning bolts at people. People used to really believe that. And then we discovered you know, static electricity and the negative and positive difference between cloud and ground. Okay? We discovered that that's really what lightning is. It's nothing to be feared, okay? except getting struck by it. Right? 
So generally speaking, guys, a lot of things start in the realm of the supernatural and end up in the natural world right? as the light of discovery hits it. So you can be aware of that as well. So these are the types of conflict, guys. One internal and three external. Okay. So if you're going to choose one of these as your point of analysis, this would probably be your easiest point of analysis for our first essay, one of these. Okay. Read the story and figure out what was the main conflict. Was it from an argument? Was it from a monkey's paw? The monkey's paw would be here, supernature, right? Because it granted wishes, but it's magic. But most of the stories, I think, are based on man versus man and man versus self. Uh, the yellow wallpaper, another one, Charlotte Gilman. Okay. Woman's locked in a room and she starts hallucinating that the wallpaper comes alive and there's people on the walls. Okay. Well, that starts out as man versus man because her husband locks her in the room, but then it slowly becomes man versus self and she's slowly going, you know, crazy, hallucinating seeing things because she's locked in her so that's an interesting angle and all stories have all of these types of conflict by the way but only one primary so for example the movie Jaws we talked about that earlier right? essentially it's a movie about a big fish that starts killing people and then they hunt it and kill it right but throughout the story you have all of these types of conflict right you have Chief Brody who's afraid of the water, and he expresses that fear. This is internal, okay? You have him talking with the wife, and every time they take a drink, she's like, wanna go to bed together? And that's an interaction, but it's showing you something about their relationship. It's building a set for the relationship, right? They're close, okay? Man versus society, right? Big argument between the mayor and the chief is that he doesn't have the power to close the beaches. And the mayor wants to keep them open, and he does, and there's another shark attack, and that's when he feels a little bad because, you know, my son go on that beach too, you know. So they have, yes, I've seen Jaws a few times. Right? So you have this society. And then, of course, the nature, the primary conflict is the shark. The type of Jaws, it's man versus nature. Okay. So it has a primary, which is man versus nature, but it's got a lot of other conflict in it as well. Guys. Just like your life, okay? different points of your life probably highlight different conflicts, okay? but you have samples of all of those in your life. Okay? In these short stories, they will have a primary conflict type. They will also have secondary conflict types. Why? Because you need them to get moving. Unless it's a story based on one guy in one room doing nothing, then you're going to have to have these things in there to a lesser degree. Okay? So everyone has a primary, but they're all there. Okay. Where are we here? We're right here the rising action. The action is beginning to rise. Conflicts are initiated. Conflicts get going. We see the problem and we see the characters moving to either go along with or go against whatever the primary conflict is. That's what's happening in the rising action. And then the climax is literally the high point of the story. This is when it all comes together, okay? and it's the turning point, okay? the point to which the rising action is leading. I know that sounds kind of simplistic, but if you remember the definition of the elements of plot, a causal series of events, things cause them, right? The rising action is now causing the climax to happen. And then right into the falling action, which is the opposite of the rising action, the tying up of loose ends, this is where the conflicts are resolved. Okay. We see the problem in the rising action, and now we've, the problem comes to a head in the climax, and now we're tying up the problem, fixing it. 
we've, we've taken the action and now the result, okay? And then the resolution is the establishment of a new norm as a result of the previous elements, right? We, we identify the problem, the problem comes to a head, we start solving the problem, and then here's life after the problem. So in the monkey's paw, for example, they make their wishes, things happen, the climax happens, the resolution becomes life after the monkey's paw. In the movie Jaws, the resolution starts as they're paddling in after they destroy the shark and they're on the, the, the buoys and they're paddling in and they're talking about the tides. Okay, that's the resolution there. Life after killing the shark. The climax of the movie happened to be him blowing up the shark. I don't know if you remember the movie. <laughs> he wedged an air canister in the thing's mouth and then he was taking shots at it and he kept missing it. And finally, with a smile, you son of a... And instead of sending bitch, it goes boom. And we'll see in the class, I remember it well. And then they paddle it. So life after that, okay? Whatever the conflict is, whatever the, whatever the climax is, life after, okay? Now in a lot of cases, life after is a sequel. Especially today, there's lots of sequels going on. So when they paddle in after they killed the shark, little do we know that shark's got a brother. And his name is Jaws too. I don't know what his name is, but I know the movie was. Okay. And then Jaws 3, and then Jaws 3D, and then Jaws 4, and blah, blah, blah. They're all conflicts. So when, when those plot lines ended, in the resolution here, they immediately started back up again. Right? And like I said over here, just like life, okay, life is a series of plot lines. So here's Jaws 1, here's Jaws 2, here's Jaws 3, here's Jaws 4, or whatever. Okay? And that's the way it works. Okay? But in the case of our stories, they wrap up. There's, really, there's no sequence. Okay? So you won't really see that. You'll see a resolution. Life after. It won't give you all the details, but it'll kind of get you set in the path of life after. Any questions? Now, like I alluded to earlier, guys, not all plot lines necessarily are laid out like this. Okay? For example, when we talk about the exposition, okay, what are we saying that modern literature has the hook in the, in the inciting climactic event? But classic lit doesn't. To Kill a Mockingbird is a good example of classic, okay? It doesn't have a hook. It starts out with Harper Lee describing the town of Maple, Alabama, in the summer, and the kids who are going to be your principal storytellers, okay? And she, she takes a long time with the exposition. Our exposition looks like that. Not quite, but that idea. It's a long, if you read, how many read Mockingbird? You must have read in high school, right? Or watched the movie, either way. The book's about the way. You'll see, pay attention to what we just said and watch it again, or read it again, and you'll see the first quarter of the book almost is her describing the town and the people and the slow pace, if you will. And she's doing it on purpose. She's trying to illustrate what it's like in the middle of summer in the 30s in a slow, sleepy southern town. It's hot, it's sticky. She says women take baths two or three times a day because they're sweating so much, blah, blah, blah. Nobody moves fast in weather like that. It's slow. And the whole pace of everything going on around the main action is slow and sluggish and shows here. And that's what she's trying to illustrate. She's physically showing you what it's like. In, you know, the middle of summer, no air conditioning, right? Um, and how, how the pace gets set. Okay? And that stays with it through the whole book. All right? Even though other things happen, that pace sticks with you because it's the beginning of the book. And it, it 
it demands to be recognized, and it is. Okay? So sometimes you'll have stuff like that where authors will literally use the plot, the plot line, to illustrate or demonstrate a point they're trying to make. Okay? So be aware of that too as you're uh, reading stories. Now most of our stories don't fall under the area of the exception. Most fall under the rule of just the five elements of plot. Okay. Be aware that it's possible that there could be other things going on. All right. Cut 